Hi guys, I'm Gwyneth Paltrow. Welcome to the Goop Podcast. Every Thursday, Goop editors will be sitting down with provocative thinkers, industry disruptors, and culture changers. I'll take turns interviewing barrier-breaking guests as we talk about shifting old paradigms and starting new conversations. Today's guest, psychotherapist and sexuality expert Esther Perel, is redefining the way we all talk about sex, infidelity, and intimacy. She's the author of Mating in Captivity and, most recently, The State of Affairs, and she also hosts her own fascinating podcast called Where Should We Begin? Over the course of the episode, she invites listeners into her therapy room as she works with couples in real time. Couples that sustained it, it's where one person who wanted it more continued to keep the foot on the pedal. Mm -hmm. And when I say more, it's not just more frequent sexual acts. I'm talking about that aura in the relationship, that energy. And the other person valued it. Every conversation with Esther is revelatory, and today she's talking with Elise Lunin, our chief content officer here at Goop, about what typically goes wrong in the intimacy realm and how we can stoke real desire. Esther also contributed to our new book, The Sex Issue. What turns her on is to be the turn on, because while the social role of women is to think about others, In order to be sexual, she has to liberate herself from the burdens of her social roles and engage in a more narcissistic experience, in the good sense of the word. That entitlement, I can think about me, I can be selfish, my turn. And that's where she will find her desire. After the conversation, I'll be doing a quick round of Ask Me Anything. If you've got a burning or totally random question you want me to answer, hit us up at Goop on Instagram or Facebook. Now, let's get to Elise and her interview with Esther Perel. What are the keys to establishing and maintaining desire in a relationship? I think I would start with what does it mean to tap into one's desire within oneself? Hmm. Because that is the prelude, the precursor of what then enters into a relationship. You know, and how do we define it? Do we talk about sexual interest? Do we talk about motivation? Do we talk about activation? So a question that I always ask is, I turn myself off how mm. or by, or what ter- is, which is very different from what turns me off is, mm. or you turn me off when. Meaning, or what, same in the reverse, I turn myself on, I awaken my desire, I ignite myself. is very different from you turn me on when and what turns me on is. Mm. So that it locates desire as a free will, as a choice that exists inside of me. But in order to experience desire, which is wanting, and which is the owning of that wanting, the fundamental thing is I have to feel that I deserve to want, that I am desirable, that I deserve this wanting, and that I have a healthy sense of entitlement that accompanies it. So that's the foundation. That has very little to do with games people play and all of that. It is really, if you don't have a basic sense of self-worth and self-esteem that accompanies this, you actually do not have the experience of desire. The next part to understand is to maintain the desire in the relationship is to understand that for some people, the desire is active and for some people it is responsive. You know, receptivity is also a form of desire. It says, I am willing, I am open, I receive you and I will respond to it. Generally, what sustains desire in a relationship has to do with imagination, but not imagination as in positions. Imagination is who am I in the story that I live in? And when you are with a person or a relationship is a story. How do we renew ourselves in that story? How, so that it's like a novel. What's the next page? Does it have something new to tell or are we just re- repeating the same, same old? That concept of imagination that comes with playfulness, with creativity, with, uh, with curiosity, is really fundamental. What you find in many couples is that they haven't said anything new to each other in a long time, and especially when it comes to erotic intimacy. Mm. What is erotic intimacy? Is when I reveal myself through my sexuality, through that language, and I tell you core aspects of who I am. And that piece somehow 
even this morning, I spoke with a woman. She just had a baby three months ago, and uh, and we and she talks about how she has very little interest at this moment. And and but of course, it's written in the book that after six weeks, she should be willing to have sex again. And that sex is defined as intercourse, which at this moment is really not on her radar. Rather than thinking about you know sexual as pleasing pleasure rather than achievement and performance, she and then she says we've never talked about any of it. And I've asked him a little bit what he likes, but he. He answers, you know, it's you I like. And so end of conversation. And he said, you know, there are people around us who don't have just exclusive relationships. And and she says, and you? And, and she says, well, I'm not interested in this at all. End of conversation. If everything the converse, if every time the conversation closes down, you kind of trample desire with it. Hmm. And so when you're talking about imagination and, and sort of having new conversations, you're specifically talking about new conversations about sex with your partner or just reinventing yourself in general? About yourself, about reinventing yourself, about, you know, when you see people, when they go out, they, they sit with their friends and they talk and they're engaged and they're awake and they're not on their phone and they're, you know, and, they, and they're talking about the book, the movie, the play, the trip, the something, you know, and they're, they are still curious about each other. They still want to know about each other. When partners leave those moments where they are with others and they listen to each other, talk to other people, and they go and they sit in the car, so often instead of continuing that conversation, it goes into, so what are we doing tomorrow morning and who's picking up what? Mm -hmm. It just literally goes from the exploratory, you know, curious engaged into the management ink mm. and it flattens it. It's just, you, you can't expect after years to just finish everything you have to do. And at 11 o'clock at night, experience some, you know, energy rise from within you that bursts and it manifests in this thing called sex. So it's a certain ability to engage with each other. It's about how I sexualize you. I still look at you, not just as the mother of my kids, but I see you as a sexual being. I kiss you, I caress you, I tease you, I sexed with you. I send you, you know, we stay engaged. I always say foreplay starts at the end of the previous orgasm, mm. <laughs> not five minutes before the real thing. And the real thing is typically defined as, you know, and the penetration that needs to end in an orgasm that is the proof that sex happened and that stops when he stops. And then we are surprised that people are not interested. No, it's not interesting. <laughs> yeah. I've heard you say this before at, at a dinner, but you said that you think infidelity, and I, I know you wrote just read a whole book about it, but that it's really seeing yourself again, like, fall, you know, experiencing yourself again. And that's the appeal, which I I might be butchering what you said, but... That resonated with me. I said it actually because I heard it like that, where people would say to me, you know, it's not that I wanted to leave my partner. The, what I wanted to leave was the person that I had myself become. Mm -hmm. It's not that I was looking for another partner. It's that I was looking for another self. Mm. I wanted to reconnect with other parts of me. When you pick a partner, you pick a story. Mm. And sometimes you realize that you're living a story and where are the others? Mm -hmm. And it is that ability to write often and to edit well within a relationship that maintains it interesting. So you come home and you, you know, instead of asking about the nitty gritty, you actually say, you know, have you ever thought about this? How would you view this? What does this, what does this mean for you? Um, uh, uh, did you ever experience something like this? It's those kinds of questions that mean that your partner, who is already so familiar, is still momentarily somewhat elusive and somewhat unknown, and you remain curious. And when you don't remain curious and you start to take your partner for granted, those are the people who are in shock when there is an infidelity. Mm -hmm. Because what they really say is, I didn't know you. That's not the person I knew. And you kind of want to say... When's the last time, you know, not, not as in an accusatory way at all, but just the notion that don't ever think that you know your partner like the inside of your pocket. You don't. Mm -hmm. You think you do because you've stopped being curious. Your partner is forever mysterious while he sits next to you or she's next to you if you allow yourself to continue to think 
There's so much more to discover about you. That is erotic energy, that mm. curiosity, because it makes you want to penetrate another, but not just with your genitals. <laughs> it makes you want to enter the universe of another person. It maintains interest. Mm -hmm. That interest translates into sexual energy. When you think about the early days of any relationship and when you're telling your story and starting the story and how exciting that is, because in a way, as you watch someone else, as you fall into love with with someone and you watch them fall in love with you, you kind of fall in love with yourself. Yes, because while you reveal yourself to me, I get to be that person that is chosen for you to reveal yourself. And I start to experience myself a certain way in your presence. I feel enhanced. I feel magnified. I feel beautiful. I feel smarter. I feel younger. I feel desired. It's all these things. You know, it's a very much a back and forth in a relationship. It's not just how I see you, but it's how I see myself in your presence and how you trick me. You know, it's like without my seeing the tools, there's something happens for me. But when you look at the beginning, people gaze into each other. They literally penetrate each other with their eyes. They kiss. They penetrate each other with the French kiss. They have ways of entering into each other that are often the things that get lost. I ask every couple, do you still look at each other? Do you, how often do you actually just lock eyes? Mm. How often do you just stay with that frozen smile? How often do you just kiss and not have that kiss be the prelude to the next thing? Mm -hmm. Because that in itself makes many people recoil because then it feels like it, the whole thing is already preset mm -hmm. and I'm just on that track and if I give you the first kiss then it's going to be the shoulder and then it's going to be the dress and then it's going to be the vagina and it's just you know and I don't want to do it if it feels like I'm just in foregone conclusion. Hmm. Is that, do you think that that's what happened? It just, it's becomes rote and therefore it loses its magic or do people just get lazy? Like all of the above. I think that if we ask, you're asking it particularly for women. Yeah. Or if we ask for women, we know some of the main elements that, in, that are uh, accomplice to the de-erotization of women in committed relationships. And the first thing is the institutionalization of the relationship. It's as if before we are institutionalized, I feel when I'm in sexual that I do what I want. After we are in that committed relationship and we've signed whatever paper we sign, then I no longer feel that I'm activating my own will. I feel like I'm doing what I'm expected. Mm -hmm. And most women know the difference. And when they have to, they don't want to. Mm. They may on occasion be obedient and compliant, but it's not about their desire. Mm. There is something about that freedom, that ownership, that is the word desire, that, uh, that, that, is, that goes against the age-old historical expectation of female sexuality being a duty. Mm. And when I'm in that realm, I don't know how to stay connected to the desire. For many women, that's number one. The second one is the derotization of her roles. Motherhood, wife, daughter-in-law, caretaker, responsible for the emotional well-being of everybody else, does not allow her or makes it harder for her, more correctly, to connect with herself. In order to tap into her sexuality, she needs to be able to think about herself. And in order to think about herself, she can't be worried about anybody else. And she finds that hard to do in the relationship where she, her role is to be concerned about so many other people. You know, there's a, a, a wonderful distinction that I, I always repeat because it's a researcher, Marta Mayana, who, who led me to this. When you listen to men in heterosexual relationships, they typically will tell you nothing turns me on more than to see her turned on. Hmm. It's important because if she's turned on, it means she's enjoying it. If she's enjoying it and she's into it, it means I'm not hurting her. Mm. And I can bypass the predatory fear, which is the central block for men, by looking at her. It is her response that tells me that I'm in the realm of pleasure and not in the realm of hurting. Mm. A woman in a straight relationship will rarely tell you nothing turns me on more than to see him turned on. Mm -hmm. It's irrelevant. Yep. It's irrelevant. What happens to him if she's not into it 
there will be zero response. He may be standing there in the, with, the, with the mighty erection. It's, he doesn't, that's not what will turn her on. What turns her on is to be the turn on. Mm-hmm. Because while the social role of women is to think about others, in order to be sexual, she has to liberate herself from the burdens of her social roles and engage in a more narcissistic experience, in the good sense of the word. That entitlement, I can think about me, I can be selfish, my turn. And that's where she will find her desire. And she finds that hard to do in the context, particularly of family life. Mm-hmm. And then the third thing is the routine. The routine, which is that it makes it look like foregone conclusion. If she wants to be chosen, mm. if she wants to be affirmed, and the whole thing is just, do you want to fool around? Or let me scratch you twice and that's a sign that we are like, you know, ready to go. Or, you know, these very un, un, unpursuing, what she calls the lack of romance. Mm-hmm. Romance is the ability to cultivate that excitement with that obstacle you know, and that mystery throughout. And she c- complains all the time, there is no romance, you know, because that pursuit says to her, I really want you. And I'm prepared to do a lot of things and I'm prepared to wait till I get you. That's how much I want you. That is the narcissistic affirmation that is so much a part of female desire. It's so true. And they're all obviously interrelated because when you're not institutionalized, there's this idea that it's just not in the bag, which adds, you know, a major element of, I think, desire and desirability and like wanting to be desired as well, which is part of it. Right. That's why she often says to him, it's not me you want, it's it. Mm -hmm. Right. I want to feel that it's me. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a sentence, you know, I want to experience your wanting of me, not just of it. Mm -hmm. And then there's the whole, as, as lives get busier and more complex of being like, I don't, I don't want you to desire me right now. Like that's not convenient, you know, drop off is in five minutes, right? The kids have to get out the door. So I think that too, I don't know. It's very complicated. Yeah, she has a way (laughs) sometimes. I mean, there's not one woman, there's many different women and many different scripts and many different scripts within the same woman. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important that we not, you know, generalize like that, but I hear it very often where she says, you know, I'm in the middle in the kitchen, you know, and he comes from behind and it's like he's distracting me and I'm not thinking about that right now. And why can't you see that I'm busy kind of thing? And, you know, it's a very interesting thing because that same woman, if she was in her affair, would not be experiencing that at all. Mm -hmm. And I often see a woman that's extinguished in her marriage and that comes to life in her affair. And it's the same woman two weeks later. Right. Where, by the way, in her affair, you know that she's doing what she wants. Mm. It is often that space where she has created in this bubble, in this utopian secret, she actually gets to do really what she wants. She activates her will completely. So when she's at home and, and, and she says, I say to her, but, you know, receive it. Just say it feels really nice. But the reason she can't is because she thinks it's of it as a misattunement. Mm. She thinks of it as, I'm, I'm doing dishes right now. How can you come with this? And basically, I say to her, he is still able, he or she, is still able to see you woman, even though you are also being mother. Take it. Mm-hmm. Take it. The day that stops, you're not in a good place. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do anything. Nothing is expected from you except to just let the other person know, I'm glad you still see me this way. And that even while I'm doing dishes, you can eroticize me or poeticize me. That is a compliment. How do you, when it gets to that place, how do you, can you walk it back? Like, do you, is there a point of no return for couples or is it easier than people think to relight the flame? If I knew that, I would write the bestseller. <laughs> you you know? do anyway. There is a lot you can turn back. It's a very interesting thing when I say it like that to women. I say, you know, you, I see so many women who tell me he no longer sees me this way. And I wish I could have <laughs> switched them, you know, because it's a gift. But you have to free yourself from the expectation. <laughs> you Sometimes, because you are in that caregiver mode, you confuse offer and demand. Mm. When he comes to tell you, you know, 
whatever he says, by hugging you, by looking at you, by kissing you, by grabbing you from the back, or whatever he does, he's not asking you anything. He's offering you something. You think this is one more child who needs attention. Mm -hmm. You infantilize your partner, for one. For two, you kill a part inside of you. Instead of saying to him, how can you think of this right now? You actually do the reverse. You say, thank you for thinking of this right now and for holding that part of me, which I sometimes don't know to how to hold on to. Mm -hmm. That makes him feel welcome. That makes her feel that she still is woman. I can't see another solution to this that is not as much of a win-win as this. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. The next one is, you know, in what way do you stay connected with that part of you? Do you experience pleasure? Do you give yourself permission to be excessive or reckless or non-responsible? Do you always go to bed at a certain time because you have to wake up the next morning? Or do you still on occasion just allow yourself no curfew so that you don't have to feel like you're a child in your own house? Mm. And all these permission elements around boundaries and around control and around surrender are actually real data for how people stay connected to their sexuality and what kind of sexuality they'll stay connected to. It's interesting. Yeah, I wonder, it seems like you could conflate as people become more restrictive in their behavior as they get older and more responsible with the disillusion of their sex life. It actually makes so much sense, right? But what's interesting is to look at those who don't. Who are the erotic couples? Yeah. You know, what do they do, these erotic couples, into their 80s? Because I think we want to learn from those who sustain it. And partly what it, you know is that they are not necessarily people with equal desire. They too have often discrepant desire. But instead of pushing the other person away when they come at them and say, how can you think about this right now? I'm so not into that. That's the last thing on my mind. They actually say, thank you. Thank you for taking me there. I don't know sometimes how to get there. I'm burdened. I'm tired. I'm worried. I'm anxious. I'm, you know, whatever it is that my mind is taken. But if you take me, I, I, won't, I just won't say no. And I'll see where it, where, where it goes. And they tell you, couples that sustained it, it's where one person who wanted it more continue to keep the foot on the pedal. Mm -hmm. And when I say more, it's not just more frequent sexual acts. I'm talking about that aura in the relationship, that energy. And the other person valued it mm. instead of looked down upon it and kind of saw it as greedy and untimely and dirty and annoying. Mm -hmm. So that's the first one. The second one is that there are people who can distinguish between high production sex and maintenance sex. Huh? They have good maintenance sex. On occasion, it's just nice. It's a five minute in the morning to wake up and it feels good. And we finish and we say, you know, who's making coffee? We don't make big declarations of, uh, you know, lifelong abiding love. We just, you know, we, we walk up together. Very, very nice. It's intimate. It's tender. It's, it's, it's the stuff you can actually do because you have a long time partner that you don't do when you're just in dating phase and you have to like bring in the big production. The next thing is that there are people who allow the sexual privacy of the other. They understand that the other has a sexual realm that doesn't necessarily belong to them. Memories, fantasies, literature, movies, porn even, you know, that, that just says you have your own world in which you activate those senses. Mm. And on occasion we share it, maybe we do, maybe we don't, but we respect it, we value it actually. And there are people who know how to show up, they know how to be present. And that, you know, it's an overused word at this point, but it basically says we, it's an important thing for us. And no, I'm not always in the biggest mood, but I never regret it afterwards. Like the gym. Mm. Never know anyone who went to the gym and said, I wished I hadn't gone. Such a good point. And do you think, let's say it's it's the morning and you're rushed and, and your husband makes a play, like, can you say, thank you? I'm glad you see that. Like, make out for a minute and be like, let's pick this up at the end of the day. Uh, totally. Okay. Totally. You know, the, the fear that many women have often with male partners is that if they start anything, they're going to have to go all the way. Mm -hmm. Rather than saying, you know, I love to kiss you like that. Ooh, that snuggle. That's just a... You know, every morning I wake up next to you and I just like, I smell you first, you know? But that means that you can't turn around and take your phone first. Too many people these days go to bed stroking their phone and wake up stroking their phone. <laughs> they don't stroke their partner. It's just real bad news out there. So 
yes, you get engaged and you just say, it feels really wonderful. Maybe later more. And you own it, you know, and uh, maybe he's frustrated, maybe he's not, whatever it is, you know, and you, but at the same time you stay, you know, it's the same time as when you go up an elevator, you know, you kiss a little bit and no, nothing may happen once you come out of the elevator, but there is an, an energy that is maintained. It's really more about energy than about performance. People can do sex and feel nothing mm. and people can hint and just imagine it and feel a lot. That is the difference between sex and eroticism. Mm -hmm. Sex is an act, but it's not just an act. It's also a place where you go. And in, and, but eroticism is sex that is imagined. Eroticism is, is that energy that allows you to imagine it without having to do it. But when you imagine it, you imagine yourself as a character in it. And that character already brings energy inside of you. And it is an erotic energy. What I mean by erotic is not sexual. It means alive, vibrant, vital. It's a very interesting thing that you can do sex and be half dead. And people complain about it all the time. He just lies there. She usually, it's a she just lies there and waits for it to be over. It's awful for everybody at that moment. Do less. Don't do that. That will, that will dry you up. Do something that you enjoy, but take ownership of it initiate it, you know, and say, I don't want this, I want that. But you want a person who wants. You don't want a person who just takes it. It's in everybody's advantage to have a woman who claims her desire. We'll have more of Elise's conversation with Esther Perel in a minute. In the meantime, let's talk about one of our partners. We all have that dress in the closet, the one that costs too much money, that you've tried on a few times and abandoned because it just doesn't look good or you don't know what to wear it with. You know, the dress that likely still has its tags on and that you don't want to give away because it was expensive. Well, anything that is an antidote to that is a good idea. Here at Goop, we abide by the thesis, make every choice count. We believe that resources are limited, money, time, materials, and that there's no reason to have a bad meal or go to a ho-hum yoga class or buy a dress that you never wear. And that's where Stitch Fix comes in. It's the perfect solution for women who don't like to shop or don't have time to shop or who have always wanted a personal stylist to pick flattering pieces that they will actually wear. I just went through the process and it was easy and fun. You enter all your basic size details, pick collages that best reflect your taste, select some of your favorite brands and stores to give the stylist a sense of what you're comfortable spending, and then they do the rest for you. You don't even have to leave the house. You can choose your frequency from every few weeks to once a quarter, and they'll send you a box of pieces that they know will fit and flatter you. There's no subscription required. You simply ship back anything that you don't want to keep. They pay for shipping and returns. Get started now at stitchfix.com goop, and you'll also get 25% off when you keep all five items in your box. That's stitchfix.com goop to try Stitch Fix today. stitchfix.com goop. Okay, let's get back to our chat with Esther Perel. Going back to infidelity, obviously transgressions happen, and some people seem to not only recover, but recover better. Like, do you, do you see it as an opportunity for renewed intimacy with your partner, or is it typically more devastating? After spending eight years on a, a deep dive study of infidelity around the world, um, I would say that there is not one answer about mm -hmm. any of this. This is a, such a complex issue that is ubiquitous, that is worldly, and that is often quite misunderstood and overly simplified into good and bad and black and white and victim and perpetrator. So what is interesting is that some infidelities will kill a relationship often a relationship that was already dying on the vine, often a relationship in which a person wanted to leave but couldn't, and this finally gives them the permission to go. I could take it when you drank. I could take it when you hit me. I could take it when you treat me poorly. I could take it when you're obsessed with your job. I could take it, but this, <laughs> now, I'm done. now I'm gone. You know, this was that. That is the thing that legitimizes one's permission to go mm. in, a, in a very interesting way which we could go into further. But then there are infidelities that jolt people out of their complacency. 
and out of their laziness and out of the indifference and the neglect that had crept up. And they experienced this as an alarm system. And it just says, ah, we have so much to lose. This is not what I want. And it, it generates in them an energy to, to fight for the relationship and to rebuild it and often to talk about things which they haven't talked about in decades. Mm. There are people who have nothing left to say and then there are people who start to talk like they haven't talked in so long with a level of depth and honesty and intimacy that was really gone. Mm. And who are the ones that do it? I can't really give you a tidy map because it's not so much related to the kinds of infidelity. There are two, I think, major indicators for those for whom an affair can become a catalyst to a relationship that may even be better than the one they had before. And the first thing is the robustness of the relationship. How many layers of connections already existed so that when this thing lands, it has kind of like a shock, um, what you call it in the car, you know, the suspension. You know, it doesn't totally flatten the couple. It, it actually lands on, on, on a certain layer of, of history, of relationship, of love, of loyalty, um, even if there was infidelity. And those are also people who are able to see each other beyond just the acuteness of the crisis. They are able to say, you hurt me so badly, you piece of whatever. But I know that in the meantime, you're the one who's been visiting my mother in the nursing home three times a week. It, 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 it does, they see the experience, it hurts them terribly, but they don't reduce the person to the full so, you know, they've become just now defined only by this one event. And the second thing is two things. Um, the second thing is two things. It's on the side of the person who had the affair, the ability to really own what they did. Even if they thought that this experience that they've had was unique in their life and deeply meaningful, they're able to, under to separate it and feel the remorse and the guilt and the accountability that is necessary for hurting their partner. Mm. That is essential. On the side of the partner, it's the ability after they feel that they have been met with compassion and responsibility in their pain, the ability to be curious about what the experience of the affair has met, meant for the other. So it's really the people who are able to live in the what did it do to you and what did it mean for me. They can integrate that dual perspective of the crisis of an affair. It is those people who often are able to take this and, and, and go from despair to repair. And are they, do they strike you as being inherently less jealous? Like, is jealousy something? No, 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 there's no connection. Mm. I can, jealousy is a, in those moments can be an amazing source of energy to fight. I am going to get you back and I'm going to reseduce you and, you know, I'm going to claim you. So it is a, a jealousy is an erotic rage. Mm. It is intrinsic to love. It says you took something that is ours and you went to give it somewhere else. I want it back. But you know, today the only place where we still can see jealousy in full action is in the opera. Huh. We don't tolerate it in our society. It's not part of the egalitarian ethos. I'm not supposed to be jealous because jealousy goes with possessiveness and it means that I have a claim on you and that is no longer OPC. So we, if you look at the magazines in the last 15 years, jealousy literally seeped out of it and has been now relabeled as trauma. The, look, there is trauma as well, but it's very interesting how many of the ingredients that are part of jealousy, the obsessiveness, the vengeance, the intrusive thoughts, the, you know, these are elements that are very much a part of the state of erotic rage. And today they are defined as PTSD. Mm. So I wrote an entire chapter in my book about jealousy because I almost wanted to create the space back to to bring it back because it's an important ingredient of love. I'm not talking about pathological jealousy. I'm talking about the, the proper reaction that people have when their partner takes the juice elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the normal response. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad response. Mm -hmm. How you use it, you know, how do, do you not let it just destroy you, but really use it is really essential. So I decided I would write an entire chapter in the book about jealousy and another one about vengeance. <laughs> it's, it's true, though, when you think about 
like a healthy dose of jealousy or even a moment of seeing your the person you love being perceived by someone else, it's very sexy. You know, when you see another woman look at your partner. Yes, it know? also means that your partner doesn't belong to you, right? Mm-hmm. As I like to say, they're only on loan with an option to renew. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it feels like it should be a part of a healthy relationship. It is. And in the North American context, it is not. Mm. But as soon as you cross the Mexican border, they understand jealousy very well. If I ask an American audience, a North American audience, to free associate about the word infidelity, I will get 50, 60 words. And I will not hear the word jealousy. And I barely will hear the word love. I will hear on the side of the, you know, I will hear the excitement and arousal and freedom and rejuvenation and all of that. And then I will hear betrayal and lying and deception and gaslighting and and addiction and all of these words on the other side. And then I say, but there is a word missing. And that is the word love. It is part of the story of infidelity. So is jealousy. If I go to Mexico and all the way down to the tip of Argentina... And I ask people to free associate about the word infidelity or tryst or hookup or fuck buddy or adventure or love story, you name it. But in the first five words, I will get love, jealousy and passion. There's something about the, the acceptance that jealousy is, is a part of it. When a partner is massively jealous about the fact that their partner had an affair or fell in love with someone else, and I say, you were wondering if you still have a man at home or you still have a woman at home, you wanted to know if she still has that because you thought she's just absorbed with the kids or this or that, you've got her. She's right here. Mm-hmm. This is a woman fighting. You know, this is a woman in the grip of her erotic rage. It's good. I mean, it's a strange way of saying it's good, but it's to say you want that. That's not a victim. No, totally. You want, and, and it's in that state of acknowledging, like, I, again, I don't own this person. I can't take this for granted. Like, but I, I want you back. I want you back. And, and I'll, I'll fight for I'll that. I'll fight. Instead of I'll punish you. I, that is in the case that I want you back. I mean, it's not, you know, but if you want him back, This is the energy you want to tap into. And now from that place, show me your dignity. Mm. I love that. Thanks so much for joining our interview with Esther Perel. You can learn about her work at estherperel.com. You'll also find more from Esther at goop.com slash the podcast and in our new book, The Sex Issue. Now it's time for that promised Ask Me Anything. Do you eat fast food and what type do you eat white rice? I definitely eat white rice. I actually don't like brown rice. A little bowl of white rice with soy sauce is one of life's utmost pleasures. I tend not to eat fast food. I eat more like fast casual. Is that what the category is called? Like I really love sweet greens and a place called Beefsteak, which is Jose Andres's kind of fast food experience. But I would say eat fast casual more than straight fast food. Have a question? Drop us a line at Goop on Instagram or Facebook. That's it for this week's episode of the Goop podcast. Thanks for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please rate, review, and share with your friends. To keep up with new episodes, just hit subscribe. And for more info, head over to goop.com slash the podcast. See you next week.